Adrian Gilbert and as you probably know I've been doing a whole load of different programs uh, looking into prophecy. Uh, I'm really quite keen on prophecy, not just Bible prophecy actually, I'm interested in other kinds of prophecy as well. I've written two books on the whole Mayan prophecy, uh, you know the whole connection with the uh, 2012, you remember all that and the, the end of the age and the Mayan age. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in what other cultures have to say besides our own. Um, but more specifically, Bible prophecy, um, there's much more there, and it is the most amazing book. And I've been looking into, uh, just recently, I've done three programs on the book of Daniel. And now we're coming back to doing more on the book of Revelation, which is the last book in the Bible. Uh, St. John, it's called the Apocalypse as well. You might know it better by that name, I don't know. But it's all about the end of the world. And the reason I, I, I did a number of programs, about a dozen programs, which brought us into chapter 9. And, and then I felt that we needed to do more, we needed to do the book of Daniel, because Daniel's a sort of prequel to the book of Revelation. And if you've already looked at Daniel and understood it, as much as one can, um, then you're in a much better position to understand the book of Revelation. If you've, if you've seen uh, Star Wars, you're going to understand what happens in Star Wars sequel. You know, the, um, uh, oh, I, don't, I can't remember what they're called now, Search for Kirk or something, was it? Um, but you know what I mean. If you've seen the, the first episode, you're going to understand the second much better. And given that the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible, it's kind of important to know a bit about what went before if you want to, to get into it. But we've done that now, and I'm getting into back into the Revelation. And this lecture is called The Second Woe and the Little Scroll. And it's, um, it's all connected with this chapter 9. We did the first, the first um, woe which I connected with the coronavirus. Uh, I, and that's quite kind of why I broke off at this point, because I felt we, we got up to date. <laughs> and what comes after that is kind of what's coming, you know, further up down the line, as it were. So we're up to, the, we're, we're still in the coronavirus nonsense. And that, I believe, is to do with the first woe. And now we're going to move into the second woe, and um, see where that takes us. Now, the second word. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had blown his trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And that's in the book of Revelation 10, 13 to 15. So we're getting, you know, it's starting to get a bit serious, isn't it? When it's talking about uh, killing a third of mankind. Uh, with this this woe that's coming forwards, this coronavirus has really not been. I know, yeah, people have died, but mostly those who have died already had other complications, other problems, or they were extremely old. Uh, there haven't been that many deaths of younger people. They mostly, if they catch it at all, they they seem to just 
you know, it's just like flu. So, but this is going to be something more serious. So that's what we're told. So I think we need to know a little bit more about it. So let's look at this. The river Euphrates has its origins in Turkey. You see Turkey at the top of the map here. Um, from there it flows through Syria and into Iraq. You can see that there. And it joins with the river Tigris and empties into the Persian Gulf just to the east of Kuwait. You can see that down the bottom there, uh, Kuwait. And the four angels who are bound at the river Euphrates are clearly fallen angels, bound there till the end times. Now, you have to understand that earlier on in the Bible it talks about fallen angels and how they were being bound. And so there are connections also, you get this in the, uh, the book of Enoch which talks about the fallen angels who came down to Mount Hermon and uh, all their names and how they, they corrupted mankind and uh, how they created these offspring that were a mixture uh, of genetics, I suppose you'd say, of themselves with, with the early mankind. And they corrupted us. And for that they were punished and some of them were chained up and bound. And you get the same kind of thing in Greek mythology where it talks about um, Prometheus who taught mankind uh, various arts and how to use fire and so on. It's the same, he, he's obviously kind of like a fallen angel actually. And he gets bound by Zeus in the Greek mythology and he, he's tied up on a rock and he has, um, there's an eagle that's pecking at his liver and it, each day it's pecking at his liver and then at night it grows back and then the next day the eagle's pecking again and that is going to go on for eternity except that he gets released by Hercules. That's all in the, the Greek myths but we're not going into that. But here within the Bible we're talking about probably something to do with fallen angels being tied down in the area of the river Euphrates which is a major river and you can see it on the map. I'll put this back. You can see it on the map here that runs up. And it, um, it kind of separates um, the sort of east from the west. Or so it did in Roman times. They, the Roman Empire did extend to the east for a short period. But then they kind of got pushed back. And they kind of accepted the Euphrates as the border between their empire and the Parthian Empire to the east. And I had some bad experiences with the Parthians. We'll talk about that shortly. Anyway, let's carry on with this. The river Euphrates has its origins in Turkey. From there it flows through Syria and into Iraq. It joins up with the river Tigris and empties into the Persian Gulf just to the east of Kuwait. The four angels who are bound at the Euphrates are clearly fallen angels bound there till the end times. It's interesting to note that the so-called Isis Caliphate had its capital at Raqqa. You, know, you can see Raqqa, I think it's on the map here, just beneath where it says Padan Aram in black lettering. You can see there, and it's actually on the Euphrates. Capital Raqqa, which is on the Euphrates and in Syria. And in biblical times, this part of Syria around Raqqa, but actually more around uh, Haran, which is in Turkey, you can see it at the top there. That area was called Padan Aram. It's where Abraham's family lived. You, you've heard the story of the migration of um, uh, Abraham, that he, he left Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. Now, if you read history books, they all tell you, ah, oh, Ur of the Chaldees, that's Ur. It's down in Mesopotamia. It's down near Babylon, right down in the south there. And he migrated, he must have gone up the river and ended up at Haran. And then he made the journey going uh, around the uh, Fertile Crescent and into what becomes it becomes Israel. Well, I don't agree with that. And actually, a lot of other people don't agree with me with that. Um, for a start, the Ur of the Chaldees, uh, the Ur, the famous city that was um, excavated 
uh, was it um, Charles Evans? Uh, Leonard Woolley? I forget who it was now, who was the British excavator, who excavated Ur, and they found all these amazing things. They said, ah, this must be Abraham's Ur, and we found uh, all the stuff to do with Abraham. Well, actually, the Ur they found was thousands of years before Abraham. <laughs> Um, the Ur, Ur just means actually in, in those old languages it means a city, Ur. And it's, it's the root of the Latin word Urbs, which also means a city. And from Urbs we get our English word urban, which means city-ish, or a, a, a place full of houses. Um, so Ur simply means a city, but Ur of the Chaldees is actually the Chaldeans, the Chaldees, lived up further north, in northern Mesopotamia. And Ur of the Chaldees was a place they called Urchai, or Urchai. And that is today um, the city of Urfa, that the Greeks knew as Edessa. And if you go there, and I've been there, um, there are caves where Abraham is supposed to have been born. I, I think it'd be very damp to be born there because it's where there's a spring and the water comes out which just supplies the city. Very, very ancient city, incidentally. And quite near Gobekli Tepe that you've probably heard of. And there are pools where Abraham... The, the story goes that Abraham was born there and he fell out with Nimrod, who was the local king. And the throne of Nimrod is a, a, a big, sort of like a raised-up cliff overlooking the city and there was a sort of castle up there a palace and there are two big pillars there which are actually Roman and the story goes that Abraham was taken up there by Nimrod and he was tied between the pillars and he wouldn't sort of bow down and worship Nimrod as a god so he got pushed off the top of the cliff and the earth opened up pools of water at the bottom and he splashed down in the pools of water and so his life was saved and after that he and his family left um, or with Charlie's offer and they migrated southwards to Haran which is not all that far away from there it's only about 30 kilometers so it kind of makes sense and that area around there was called Paddan Aram but Abraham himself didn't hang around there uh, a couple of his sons did, I think, uh, and his his brother, Lot. Yeah, you've heard of Lot and how Lot had to... He, he, he went on to Sodom and had to escape from Sodom when it was all being punished. But that's all biblical history. You can read about it in the book of Genesis. But this area here was called Paddan Aram, so it's kind of an important area in the Bible, in the early part of the Bible. It's sort of where the Abrahamites come from originally so anyway um, it's where the Abraham's family lived it's also included in the Assyrian Babylonian Persian Greek and Roman empires now if you've been uh, watching my other lectures on the book of Daniel <coughs> you'll understand that this was a succession of empires um, which each one in turn dominated um, Jerusalem and Judea um, and that was kind of like a punishment uh, on the Jews for having worshipped false gods, um, particularly uh, uh, Baal uh, and a few others. So they, they, they'd done some very evil things, let's put it that way. And then they were taken prisoner to Babylon, but that's a whole other story. So anyway, this area was very important as, of course, is Israel. So it, it comes up here um, in connection, I think, with the, the river Euphrates and the idea that these fallen angels are bound there and going to be released at the end of the age. So now if we carry on here, and the Bible goes on. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the colour of fire, and of sapphire, and of sulphur, and the heads of the horses were like lions' heads, and fire and smoke and sulphur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire 
and smoke and sulphur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. So that's Revelation nine seventeen to 19. So what's this all about? Um, we, we had this earlier thing with the, uh, the earlier um, uh, woe, the first woe, where the, the abyss was opened by Abaddon or uh, Apollyon. It's, I'm not quite sure if it's a good or bad angel. <laughs> But the boat Apollyon actually seems to be the same name as the Greek god Apollo. And he was kind of a, in charge of oracles and also causing pandemics and diseases as punishments for mankind. So you can see the connection there. Although the Greeks later on made him much more of a sun god, and a god of uh, knowledge and the arts. Um, but he has his earlier connection and he, he comes from Anatolia originally. Uh, in, in Greek mythology, uh, being connected with this idea of pandemics and plagues being sent. So he opens the lid of the abyss and all these nasty things come out, which cause the virus, the coronavirus. I think that's what it's referring to. Um, but it's, interestingly, in the first plague, it says, you know, that hurt there to be hurt, but not to die. Well, I know, yeah, people have died, but not a huge number. It's not been like a sort of wiping out half the human race type thing. But this next plague, we're told, is going to be much worse than that. Well, let's get on. Um, the description of the army of horsemen is symbolic. The number of 10,000 times 10,000 equals 100 million. You can work that out. But there's never been an army that size in history. And Hitler's army for the invasion of the Soviet Union was only 4 million. And that was enormous by all other standards. I think probably only the Chinese could mount an army that size, and I'm not sure even they could. Uh, 100 million is a, an awful lot of people. When you think of it's not just you've got to have the people wandering along or travelling somehow, but you've got the logistics. How do you feed such an army? How do you... How do you equip them? How do you deal with them? Um, where do they all go? I mean, it's obviously meant to symbolically mean an awful lot of people, an awfully big army. But it actually, I think, means something else. And we'll go to this a little bit. Now, the symbolism of the horses tells another story. The head of a horse indicates in this context a connection with the Babylonian Empire. Now, the reason for that is that the Babylonian Empire, and I've said see Daniel, um, the Babylonian Empire is symbolized by a lion, a winged lion. So the lion head kind of symbolizes something to do with the Babylonian Empire. And of course this area was under the Babylonian Empire. And the tails, like headed serpents, indicates a connection with Satan. Satan, you know, is a dragon, but he's also a serpent. So it appears that what is released from the Euphrates are demonic forces. But there is something else. Um, curiously, it was, it was at Haran, Padan Aram, that the Parthian horse archers defeated the Roman army in the Battle of Carre. Carre is the Roman name for Haran. And this is one of Rome's biggest defeats and was accomplished by horse archers and cataphracts. Now cataphracts are uh, heavy cavalry with armoured knights, we would call them knights now, and horses with armour plating to protect them as well. They had those in Roman times, and it wasn't only the Romans that had them. Um, and they were carry lances and r very, very dangerous. You, you know, t you, you wouldn't want to get in their way. But mostly what the Parthians had were horse archers. And at the Battle of Carre, what they did, basically the Romans formed a square. And the Parthians 
rode round and round firing arrows into them and occasionally the cataphracts would attack and try to sort of shock them and and just uh, you know get them uh frightened by by that and that, that crassus was a lousy general i have to say um and he sent his own um cavalry to, to chase down these horse archers and and try and stop them firing the arrows at the infantry and all they, the the horse archers did was ride away firing backwards in the saddle until they'd taken the cavalry away far enough and then the cataphracts could attack the uh, infantry blocks and they destroyed the cavalry of the you know the horse archers had far more of them than than the, the Gaulish cavalry that Crassus had with him and then of course they went and they finished off the infantry captured many prisoners Roman prisoners Crassus himself died in the battle as did his son and it actually had a huge effect, changed Roman history. So you can see that this area is associated with horses and horse archers and battle. Um, but the curious thing is that Daniel was writing this centuries before Crassus had his, his uh, big defeat. I think it was around about 50 BC or something like that. So this is a very... Um, very interesting symbol that is being produced here in the book of Revelation. And of course, St. John, yeah, he would perhaps have known about the Battle of Carre because he was coming after that. And he would know that that area of, the, of Syria had been the site of this huge Roman defeat. Or more to the point, whoever was instructing him knew about that and used this imagery. Uh, to some effect. Now, the release of a huge army of deadly horsemen from the vicinity of the Euphrates is like opening the gate of the abyss by Apollyon, and it's clearly symbolic. The horsemen symbolise demons with savage power to inflict suffering, first in Syria and then elsewhere. I think we can see that. But look, here's something else. One manifestation of this, this which is, i.e. the release of the demons, seems to be the Isis Caliphate. Its headquarters were at Raqqa in Syria, just down the road from Haran. And even by the standards of Islamism, I'm not saying Islam, but this extreme version, we... we we talk about Islamist, um, Islamist terrorism, don't we? Islamism, these terrorists. Uh, the behaviour of ISIS towards Christians and other non-Muslims was extreme. ISIS seems to be one manifestation of these demons from the Euphrates. I mean, no, who would have believed it? That in the 20th century, there would be people, you know, not just taking prisoners not just fighting wars, but for religious reasons, cutting people's heads off. I mean, who would have believed that? This is something that we've not seen since medieval times. It's just, well, it's out of this world. It's just so shocking. It's beyond shocking. And of course, these people, I believe, these, these Islamist terrorists, were demonically possessed, still are. Um, so that's one aspect of this release of this second woe. But of course, the, these people were before the second woe. Um, it's a sort of prequel again <laughs> for what's coming. And I, there, there can be other reasons for this. Uh, so the release of, huge, of a huge army of deadly horsemen from the vicinity of the Euphrates could also reflect the refer to flying demons. The horsemen are like demons with savage power to inflict suffering. Their attack begins in Syria and then spreads elsewhere. On the other hand, the description could apply to horseflies. That's a nasty looking beastie, a horsefly. Um, these demonic insects inflict painful bites with their mandibles. 
The females do this to gain access to blood. They need this to do this in order to produce eggs. Housefly bites are painful in themselves, but the flies can also serve as vectors for other parasitic infections. Now, just I, I don't know if you ever had a horsefly bite. I've had them. They really hurt, and the, the blood comes out, and the fly flies off before you can spot it, and it comes back to take some more blood if it can. Um, it's a different technique from mosquitoes, which stick a little tube into you and suck the blood out. Uh, the horseflies are much more brutal uh, in the way they do it. They're you know, tearing at the flesh. So are we looking at horse, some kind of horsefly type infection coming out of the Euphrates? Well... Uh, in the last video, I linked to the first woe of chapter 9, I've said all this, after the fifth angel blew his trumpet with the coronavirus epidemic. We'll just flip over that quickly. Corona is Latin for crown. In the Revelation, the first woe is a widespread infestation of symbolic flying creatures, the COVID virus or virons, that sting, i.e. penetrate cells, and are like crowns. Corona. I think that makes a kind of sense. And these creatures, you can call them that, um, are released into the air after the door to the bottomless pit is opened by an angelic being termed Apollyon uh, in Greek and Abaddon in Hebrew, both words meaning destroyer. So perhaps this virus, uh, the, this, the, these uh, virons, these beasties that are released from the abyss were released in China. And think about it. Well, we blame the Chinese authorities. We blame the Wuhan laboratory. We blame the bats. We blame the, what, the pangolins, are they? Uh, we blame all sorts of things for this. But maybe it's a demonic thing that was released there and then spread to the, the entire world and it's caused all these lockdowns, it's caused uh, terrible destruction to the economies of countries, uh, America, Britain, Europe, other countries all over the world, except actually China, interestingly. Um, they've suffered tremendous um, destruction of their economies, uh, loss of jobs, loss of revenues, running up debts, etc. So that seems to be more what this pandemic was for. It wasn't so much to kill people as to destroy economies. So this first virus seems to have been released by the demons, the devil, whoever, um, with the intention not so much of killing people. And in the, in the uh, Revelation it says, you know, they're to hurt and wound but not to kill. Um, but to destroy economies and create chaos in the world so that something else, a reset, I don't know, um, some kind of revolution can take place more easily than if people were feeling well and everything was going fine. So uh, I'll leave that with you. and Let's see where this other one takes us. Um, it is therefore quite possible that the second woe will also be a pandemic, but a rather different one. It seems it will begin in Syria, perhaps among the refugee, refugees living in tented camps. It will be much more deadly than the coronavirus, which most people recover from quickly. The second pandemic will likely be waterborne. Remember the river Euphrates, perhaps being carried by horse flies. Well, you know, it's supposed to be like horses, and their bites are what are nasty, bite like lions. At a guess, I would suggest it will be a kind of malaria that starts with a painful bite and results in parasitic infection with a nematode worm. The, toe, the tail. These parasites could be serpent-like in appearance. 
Now, you know, I've said horseflies, but I mean, there's lots of other nasty flies they have out in hot countries. We don't have them in Britain, um, but uh, there's all sorts. You go to India or somewhere and there's all sorts of beastly flies out there that can bite you and give you all kinds of nasty diseases. So perhaps we're talking about something along those that line of a pandemic spread by biting insects that um, put some kind of nematode worm or perhaps it could be a kind of a Ebola something, something of that sort. But it seems to be whatever's coming is going to be more dangerous and we really need to be on our guard for this one even more than we have been for the coronavirus. Unfortunately, even after these woes, the majority do not repent of their ways or seek God. This is what, what's said in the Bible. Instead, many turn once more to Satanism in all its guises. They do so as always to seek power and wealth in this world. Now, I just want to say a few words about this. I mean, I'm sure quite a lot of people who are watching this um, don't really believe there's such a thing as a devil or Satan or anything of that sort. And I want you to get away from this idea of this kind of horned beast, you know, with his hairy legs and sitting, you know, with a upside down pentagram on his chest and all that kind of symbolism. It's not like that at all. We're talking about an entity just like an angel. Well, he is an angel. And just as you have good angels, you have bad angels bad angels being fallen angels, and they want to perpetuate a system on earth that favours them. And what they want is to be able to live on this planet, getting enough food without having to be dependent on uh, what you could call the ambrosia of the gods, <laughs> the sacred um, sacramental stuff the, the Logos food that comes down the way of creation and feeds all of creation, feeds the angels. They're cut off from that. So they have to live here feeding off organic life and in particular off people. And they do that in many different ways, partly through terrorizing people, partly through seducing them, partly through killing them and, and taking the energies as they come out of the dead person. Uh, you know, th th these are really not nice things at all. But they also have other people who are their servants. Yeah, and those servants are rewarded. And they can be rewarded with wealth. They can be rewarded with sexual attractiveness. Um, they can be rewarded with power, prowess. And these are, these are real things. These are not, I'm not just making this up. Right through history, people have understood this. And the whole thing about the Bible and, and Christianity is that it's going to end that and reestablish the connection between the human race and heaven. Establish the kingdom of heaven on earth is what Jesus talks about. And of course, the devil, Satan, is the prince of this world. Every planet has its own prince. And he doesn't want that at all. So he's kind of fighting a rear guard action here. And there are people who are consciously or unconsciously in his pay. They often start off unconsciously being drawn, you know, um, you know they're bribed. They, oh yeah, a bit of fame, that's wonderful, yeah. Oh, I want more of that. I want more, I want more. And eventually they end up selling their soul in order to carry on the high of the adulation of the crowd if they're some kind of pop star perhaps or film star or wanting more and more power if they're a politician and they'll sell out their country they'll sell out anyone just to have that power and these are very real things, and this is worshipping the devil. It doesn't have to be that you go up to a wooden statue and kneel in front of it and say, please give me power. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, it's actually more to do with a spiritual 
meaning than with um, physical worshipping of an idol, although that does happen as well. So this is what this seems to be talking about. So the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, that's the first two woes, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood. And you notice that's a descending order of value, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. And I put down here, eyes wide shut. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that, um, that movie. And it talks about, well, not directly, but it kind of indicates a kind of seedy level of Satanism in Hollywood. Um, quite a frightening movie in its own way. Uh, but that goes on, you know. And that is what I think this is talking about and that we need to be on our guard for. So moving on from there, we then come on to the, la the little scroll. Now, this is a, in, in the next chapter in the Revelation, and I've done this, I've, I've done these two together because they're quite short pieces, and I'm, I'm going to go on in the next lecture, we'll go into the two prophets, which is kind of a, a bigger subject in a way. But anyway, the little scroll. So then I, which is John, saw a, another, uh, another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. So you can see him there in this uh, painting. He had a little scroll opened in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. And when he, he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So we're told here that uh, John got some inkling about something that he's going to write down and put in his book. He's told, no, don't do that. This is not to be talked about at this time. The little scroll is possibly a reference to the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Here Daniel is given some insight into what is to come at the end of the age. But he is admonished, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. So this is what we're saying here. So Daniel's also seen this guy. <coughs> Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And that's in Daniel 12, 4. And later, I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. And that's Daniel 12, 8 and 9. So we're, we're having this connection here, I think, between um, the vision of St. John and the vision of Daniel, a similar kind of vision. And in the Revelation, John is told to take the scroll and eat it. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So that's the same one that, that Daniel had seen, and he was told not to, to reveal it. So he's, he's been told now that he's got to eat it. Um, so I went to the angel, I told him to give me the scroll, and he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, uh, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from his hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, uh, I'm, 
I was told, must again be prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So there's going to be more prophecies coming for uh, John in, involving many peoples and languages and kings, nationalities and kings. So that's all going to be coming. And he's told he's got to eat this. Now, what does that eating mean? Well, I think the sweet taste in his mouth that is the uh, is is the, the the sweet feeling, the initial feeling of revenge that at last justice is to prevail. And bitterness comes with the realization of the suffering that will entail. So we all want revenge over our enemies. Might not admit it, but wouldn't you like to see those people of those ISIS people who cut the heads off those guys? those Christians, wouldn't you like to see them all um, executed or at least put in jail for the rest of their lives? I think we'd all like to see that. We'd like to see them, them receive the same punishment they gave out to other people. Um, if you're a Christian or a charity will say, well, you know, they must be forgiven their sins. But you certainly don't want them running around cutting other people's heads off. Um, but what it's saying here is that it's all one thing to to, to uh, want the sweet honey of revenge and for justice to be served on those who've done such awful things in this world. But you have to realise that in the execution of that, it's going to cause a lot of suffering. And that's the bitter bitterness in the stomach. You get bitterness in your stomach when you're liverish and you're getting bile coming up from your liver. And that seems to be what it's talking about here, the sort of the, the bitterness of the bile bitterness of having eaten something not very good. And yeah, it tasted all right initially, but now you're regretting it. You've got indigestion. So that's kind of where we're up to now in this, um, this episode. There's much more to do in the Revelation. And uh, I want to press on and do all this. Uh, I know I've delayed for a few months, but it was for other reasons. And f partly to get the Book of Daniel material done. Partly because I felt we'd caught up and I needed a breather um, before plunging headlong into the rest of this most extraordinary book. So I hope you've found this, uh, th this lecture useful and interesting. And I look forward to joining you again. Thank you.